set my timer here, everybody. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, just, first of all, it's great to be here. I remember, uh, I don't know, February 2020, doing some of these discussions in person, and then it feels like we went away. So it's so nice to be back in space with people, with the community. So I'm really grateful to be here today. Also want to thank uh, Dr. Peasley on, on her way out, or, or she left, but um, hearing her remarks as well, I am a uh, first-generation college student and a Pell Grant recipient as well. That's how I made it to college. So it's always rewarding for me to hear um, her talk about how deeply involved that is with our mission today as well. I also want to thank Julie for your comments about purpose and uh, linking that to the, the work we do together in the Academy of Finance. Um, these programs and these opportunities that we create for students many times become the hook for why students continue to come to school and continue to take steps forward in a positive way. Um, sadly, our educational system doesn't do that for all students. We know that. We can look at data points uh, and uh, lots of indicators that tell us that we haven't found that hook for all students. This is one example of the Academy of Finance at Cullen Park Senior High that certainly meets that mark. So I have uh, probably just a few slides here and could easily um, spend hours uh, on the content, but I'm not going to do that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm not going to do that. What I want to do is just share a little bit about St. Paul Public Schools. I want to share a little bit about our plan and what our vision is. But most of all, I want to have a conversation with you and see what kind of questions that you might have uh, about anything and everything. And let me tell you, um, you know, if I, if I spoke to you about the first half hour of my day, that would take forever with, with how we are responding to uh, not just the pandemic, uh, staffing our schools, uh, making sure that our, our campuses are safe and secure. Um, it has been a real challenge, a real challenge. And I'm only one person speaking about it at this level. Um, I'm not in the classroom. I'm not in the schools. I'm not, you know, driving the bus or, or on the playground supervising students in these really challenging times. Uh, but this is our student body. We are a beautifully diverse school district, as you can see, um, almost 36,000 students, as it was mentioned, pre-K through grade 12. Uh, our Asian population, Hmong being the largest in the Southeast Asian uh, group makes up the majority uh, of our students. Uh, but you can see we have a great distribution of uh, incredible uh, racial diversity. Uh, the language is mentioned as well, 125 languages that can uh, also be incredibly overwhelming. And we try to address that in so many ways. We have uh, uh, different English language, uh, English learner programs at each of our campuses. We have what we refer to as language academies. Uh, so if a student or a child is new to the country, uh, new to the English language, we have support uh, from day one for how to program and support families and students uh, you know, for, for their learning experience here in St. Paul Public Schools. Um, the district has had great programs in that regard for decades. Um, we continue to look for ways to, to make that uh, you know, even better and even stronger. It used to be, and I'll focus on this just for a moment, that students new to the country went to another place, went to a, a school that was isolated maybe from their community, a school that was isolated for how all students learn and how all students are supported. And we have removed those barriers and made sure that our students or any student for that matter in St. Paul Public Schools can attend any school that they choose. Uh, they, they really can. Now we're always real and upfront about the supports that might be necessary to make sure that they're aligned. Uh, but by all means, we wanna help our students be part of an inclusive community. And as I think about uh, two and four year colleges, as I think about the workforce, I think that's what we want in those spaces as well. So I feel like we can really deliver on that and help uh, to create that sense of, of inclusivity uh, through our school district. So I won't go through all the details of this plan. I'll just start by saying that in, that in 2018, the Board of Education approved the long-term student outcomes. Uh, what it is that we are going to measure? Why did we want to create this plan? What did we want to achieve by this plan? And the strategic focus areas. I'll get to this one in just a moment because it began with these five, positive school district culture, effective and culturally responsive curriculum, uh, effective... Uh, use of and resources and uh, allocation of resources, program evaluation, college career readiness, and family community engagement. And I want to share this with you. You know, we have uh, programming pre-K through 12. 
And if I could just spend a minute to share with you what my vision is for that. Because when I arrived here, I found that like many school districts, we continue to operate and this is our system. Um, here is where you start, you fit into the system and you succeed or you don't fit and you do not succeed. And that's how school has been. That's how it's been experienced. This is my 27th year in education. I spent my first 18 in Madison where I'm from, um, four years in Burnsville, Egan Savage, my fifth year now in, in St. Paul. And there are some common threads in all three of the districts I've worked in and hundreds of districts around the country I've interacted with the research. And we are a very rigid system in terms of what we want students to know and be able to do. Um, and we're seeing the impact of that. And especially these last two years, as we've had to respond in ways never heard of before um, in, in our workforce, in the way we work together, and how you get, let's not get into politics, but how you work together to solve really complex problems. And we're expecting our children to be able to do this. And uh, we've got to look at the way that we're uh, you know, preparing them. We've got to look at the way that our school district is, is operating to do that. So two years ago, we started what we call a personal learning plan in St. Paul Public Schools. Now, the way that I experienced a personal learning plan, and probably many of you, I was 16 years old, and I was at my alma mater, LaFayette High School in Madison, and I took a test. And that test was to measure skills that I believed that I had and, and things that I liked to do. And at 16 years old, I was told, well, here's what it says you might want to be. Well, the problem is with that um, is that two-thirds of my education is over at 16. So we tend to look at future uh, far too late in how we are supporting our school system to help our students, what I've now called, develop a career identity, to develop motivation for that career identity. And let me be very clear, because some of you might start to think, oh my gosh, she's saying you want preschoolers to declare a major and declare a career. That's not it at all. Uh, you all know the skills, the transferable skills that are, that are present in the workforce and at all levels. Um, so as I think about the personal learning plan at St. Paul Public Schools, it starts at pre-kindergarten. And it starts with asking our students, our young scholars, our beautiful young scholars, some pretty basic questions. How do you see yourself? What are you good at? What do you want to be? What are some things you want to work on? Now, we may do that informally, but we're trying to do this in a very formal way, in a very structured way, because I believe that our system should change and adapt in order to raise up those assets that are self-identified by our students. To me, that's how the system can change. To me, that is equity and, and how we meet the equitable demands um, on our system. You know, we spend so much time and money trying to fix students who we deem broken. We really do. What are their deficits and how can we improve them? And we can do that. We do. And there's some pretty successful work and intervention work that, that does that. But I think we're missing out on such an opportunity to find what sparks each one of our students have and to make sure that we're igniting those, to make sure that we're giving them that identity to move forward. So our personal learning plan starts in pre-kindergarten and then guides through. And again, we're about two years in, maybe a year. You know, We piloted it. Now we're in year two where we're expanding it throughout the entire district. And this will stay with them. This will be an electronic portfolio. I also believe that this is a community uh, tool and that our community partners, parents, family members, uh, mentors, volunteers, church, wherever students uh, are, you know, these are individuals that can be engaged in, in their guidance and know and, and bring light to this uh, really important uh, document uh, that is going to guide our students. As we get into elementary school, our primary grades, our focus is on uh, literacy and uh, the efforts underway right now to address what the pandemic is called learning loss. Um, what we are calling it at St. Paul Public Schools is what I need now or when. Um, and you know, it, to me, this is an effort not just for the pandemic, it's how we should be oriented every day. What do our students need and what are we going to do in order to help them? So in our literacy work right now, we have, um, Every one of our schools, elementary schools, has a teacher that's dedicated to literacy instruction. A teacher is able to work with other teachers uh, to use data, not just at the end of the quarter or end of the school year or when standardized tests come in, but to use data every day to see where students are struggling and to try to give them what we call in education sometimes an extra scoop uh, to help them get back to where they need to be uh, so that they can access 
uh, information to be successful in their, in their courses. Now we do this, but many children in the system that we currently have are left out. You know, we don't have the, the tools or the uh, sometimes the, uh, the the staffing or the or the uh, professional development or the opportunities uh, to spend the time to really focus on this with with all of our, our schools. So creating that system is something that we've been working on, but the pandemic has accelerated that for the work that we're doing. Middle school in part of our strategic plan here, I believe you'll see it right in. These are out of order from what they normally are, but middle school model is one of our strategies. I believe it's in resource allocation. And again, St. Paul Public Schools, like a lot of districts in Minnesota, have gone through the transition from junior highs to middle schools. They're very different. A junior high is, is nothing more than a here's your schedule. Good luck. Um, we'll get your grade checks in nine weeks and your quarter grades or your semester grades at you know the end of the term. Um, in a middle school model, we are very intentionally grouping students. We are very intentionally making sure that we have all the foundational skills present and that students are able to, to receive them and the, and the supports. But the most important piece is, is that we're allowing our students to explore uh, some of the areas outside of the core curriculum areas. And uh, for me, again, this can't just be if you go to this school, you can explore these things. It has to be how does our system prepare our students? How does our system expose our students to what they like? And just as important, maybe what they don't like. Because let's face it, our sixth grade students are very soon going to be picking and choosing courses uh, that could have a very substantial outcome on their futures. So our middle school model um, has been very successful. It's something that I, that truthfully, we campaigned our referendum on in 2018. It's something that I said to the community we were going to deliver. And the results really showed. Uh, now that's not to say middle schools are perfect. I'm a two year middle school principal recovering still from those two years. Uh, really challenging assignment, really challenging. High school coach, high school biology teacher, you know, size, I thought I was going to go in and, and rule that school. It can be extremely challenging. Um, and we haven't even talked about social emotional learning. And, and that's what I find is many times the missing piece as well. If we can't address social emotional learning, uh, learning uh, school or core curriculum is going to be very, very challenging. Uh, so in the high school, here's where to me, um, we have a real opportunity. Now, I think there are a lot of partnerships, Academy of Finance has mentioned, uh, but the pathway explosion work that we're doing in the district, um, I believe is, is really unknown to many. Uh, I think if you would look at what we offer uh, opportunities at each of our comprehensive high schools, especially, and then of course here at Gateway to College, um, I think you'd be amazed and surprised uh, to know that we really are trying to change what does a high school education look like? So that it isn't just uh, here's what I'm good at, here's what I might want to do. Let's get let's give students exposure and chances to develop deep interest and experiences in a while they're in high school. And I talk about diagonal movement all the time. And what I mean by diagonal movement is always decisions that I make. I want students to be able to advance towards their high school graduation, but I also want them to be able to move side to side. Right? If I have an interest in in aquatic biology. And I realize I don't really like doing field experiments. I can move into something else while I'm still moving forward. It isn't like in college where you graduate 160 credits and you're like, oh my gosh, that took three extra years. We don't have that luxury in high school. Uh, we really don't. We certainly hope we don't. So we want to make sure that our students have the ability to, to move and be flexible without punishment, without the system pushing back against them. Again, to uh, be sure that we're aligned to work what they, how, how they see themselves. During the pandemic, here's what I learned. I learned that we can uh, learn and teach in many different ways. Now, for some, it, it wasn't very good. Right? I had a senior last year, a uh, senior in high school, our youngest, and, and watching him struggle through distance learning was eye-opening for me and, and painful, quite honestly, at times. For others, they flourished for a lot of different reasons, and many were in between, you know, day by day, kind of like high school students. But what I have often thought about is, and we started creating an online school in October of 2019, before I even knew COVID-19 was a word, uh, we started to create an online school because I thought that it could uh, offer flexibility, flexibility to the learning day. You see, and here's where many of you might be involved. A lot of the work that we do in partnerships, a lot of the work we do in all the school time programming for students happens after school 
um, maybe on the weekends, a few programs that serve students on weekends or in the summer. And what happens is students typically get funneled and then there's a capacity because there's only so much time after school or a student has to say, you know, I really want to be on the uh, baseball team, but I also want to gain work skills. I also want to get a, have a paid internship so that I can make money for my family. And we force students at this age where they are taking in so many opportunities to make choices. And I think we can be more flexible than that as a, as a learning institution. I, I really do. So ready for this? I have begun to propose and talk about a 12 hour school day. Okay, and I like saying it that way because people like, what is he talking about 12 hours? Well, here's what I'm talking about. This isn't formal. These, this is, you know, these are my awake at night moments. This is what I think about and dream about. Eight to 12, 12 to four and four to eight. If we break the school day up in segments like that, why couldn't we have a student at a paid internship in the morning taking classes brick and mortar at their school in the afternoon and still participate in after school activities? Or we could have a student who has to do childcare at home and help out, wake up, do classes online, go to their internship in the afternoon and work at night if they have to. I mean, think about all the different combinations of how we patch together and by chance there's opportunities for students we could expand if we really explore how to do that. Now, the system is built on how many students are in the class and how many rear ends are in the seat, okay? How many minutes and hours are they there so that we can get funding from the state of Minnesota? Important, okay? My, my life is ruled by ADM, average daily membership, in order for us to receive the funding from the state. But I don't know if the funding from the state is, is truly doing what it is in the current system. And I think we could probably look at many data points and say that that's true. And it isn't just St. Paul Public Schools, it's around the country. So I'd really like to push this idea of a flexible school day and continue to work with you and with others to, to say, how could we do this differently? You know, how could we truly uh, meet the needs of our students in a new way that solves so many of the challenges that we have? You know, when I look around at the workforce in the Twin Cities, you know, in the time that I've been here now, there's this constant buzz of, we want more staff of color in our schools. And then I come back and say, I want our student classrooms, I want our workforce to look like the classrooms I see. There are huge disconnects in how we're doing this. There really are. And a lot of that comes back to what we added this year into our strategic plan of systemic equity. And systemic equity for me, you know, you can be part of a diverse community and a diverse school district and think because of that, you work on equity because you care. But the caring that we've done has led to some of the most dismal outcomes when you look at student groups uh, ever. When you see when you say or see who's accessing these great opportunities, it's one thing to say all students have access to this. And this is the very best. But when you look at it, you realize that not all student groups are there. Then you have to ask why. Then you have to identify what are the barriers. And then you have to have a system in place to remove those barriers. And then most importantly, this is where equity breaks down a lot. We can put people in spots, but if we're not gonna support them, they will not succeed. So what is that support piece? Equity is not just a single focus and it isn't just a data point. It is the way that your system completely changes and how you identify barriers, remove them, uh, strive for access, and, even mo and most importantly, have support in place so that, so that young people and families can be successful. Um, it is a really important goal for us to have systemic equity as part of that. Our racial equity policy is not enough. It just isn't. I've learned that because I know how our students are doing and I know where they're struggling. So we've got a lot of great work to do in that regard. One other thing, um, my gosh, I went fast. One other thing that I wanna mention because there's a missing piece you know, I started talking about pre-K to 12 and 12 plus, obviously, with some of the discussion. There's one other piece. We know that the best indicator of school success is the students who are ready for kindergarten. Okay? Identifying letters, writing numbers, uh, early literacy skills, phonemic awareness, right? We can start to sound out letters. We need to do this in a better way as well. Currently, 1,300 students are involved in our pre-kindergarten program. It's the state's largest full day pre-kindergarten program. And we're very proud of it, but we're patching the funding together to do that by four different funding sources. And we have a waiting list. 
And I should tell you that we prioritize students who need it most. I mean, that's our, again, that is our window of looking into who should have access into this. We wanna make sure students who need it most are able to access that. There is an effort underway right now, two efforts that I wanna to bring to your attention. Uh, the first is at the federal level the, in the Build Back Better plan, $400 billion right now is being earmarked to early, to, to education, to early childhood education. I won't get into all the details of that because they've got enough to figure out there before we ever see that. Um, but I wanna tell you about a local initiative uh, that I'm also part of and have been for four years and three months, which is the time I've been in St. Paul. Council member Rebecca Naker approached me very early on as we were meeting each other and said, I wanna share with you a vision I have for early childhood in St. Paul. And when she shared the idea with me, I said, I'm in, and I've not left her side since. Um, I've missed very few meetings and will tell you that uh, the work over four years to create our coalition that's now, now called St. Paul All Ready for Kindergarten, S-P-A-R-K, SPARK, uh, is a potential reality for St. Paul. What SPARK would do is it would provide support to families of all three and four-year-olds in the city of St. Paul to participate in a high-quality educational experience, pre-K for three-year-olds and four-year-olds. This would be a mixed delivery system because we can't do it alone. That's about 8,000 little people. You know, we have 1,300 right now, and it's hard enough to house that many. This is 8,000 if you talk about all three and four-year-olds in the city. So we'd have to work with our nonprofits, our partners, and home providers and home care providers as well. To, but to establish the system where the financial, uh, financially where it can be shared and where there can be a high level of, of curriculum and planning to ensure that it is a system that's, you know, that is, that is serving the equitable needs of, of our students. Um, so that coalition has been coming together and has been working. I would uh, welcome an opportunity. I can talk with Chad in the future to see if council member Naker or others uh, can come and, and interact with you to share more about that. But I think it could be life-changing for a system that for so many has been lifeless. Um, it really has. We do a great job of, I've been on this stage right here in this room, graduating students. I often wonder in the time and most of my years have been spent in secondary, so I've got firsthand experience with lots of students. Uh, what does this diploma mean? What are you going to do with it? How have we prepared you? Could we have done more? Uh, this is our chance as a community to look at our three-year-olds differently. You know, the mayor has college-bound St. Paul, so every child born in the city has a 50-hour college savings account. To me, this is one more deposit in that account to say that we see you, we matter, uh, we wanna help you develop dreams, and we wanna help you create a motivation to reach your potential. Um, it's, it's critically important to me, uh, you know, that, that we do this. So again, I, uh, I've got other slides and I could share a lot with you, but I really want to engage more with you and see what questions uh, that you might have. Uh, Chad, Chad, and then down here. Sure. Uh, a question came up. Uh, my assistant shared that a question might come up about Genesis Works Twin Cities. And I'm like, I can talk about this. I'm on their board. So Genesis Works Twin Cities is a, is a nonprofit, and it really strives to work with uh, the tech field in, in the community. And what I mean by that is that students are selected, and they go through a rigorous process um, of, of spring interning, of summer learning how to be a tech employee, a tech professional, and then they are working with that organization as well. So Genesis Works comes together and, and puts in the infrastructure to help train, uh, prepare students for interviews, you know, all the soft skill gathering that, that students are going to need, supporting students, and they pay them uh, for participating in that internship. So that's the, the work of the nonprofit. We have uh, organizations like Target, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, TCF, Huntington. Uh, are we calling that Huntington now, I, I think? Um, you know, some of the larger groups uh, that, are, that are represented there and serve on the board uh, along with me. Um, and it is, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful partnership. And I'll, I'll share this with you as well. It's not easy. It's rigorous. You know, so I always think of it this way. If, if this is rigorous and, and I know that, you know, many of our students may not qualify or may not be selected, what can we do to prepare students so that they are ready? This is where that younger 
work comes into play. You know, if we wait until they're 16 and say, oh, I wish I would have, students only have school once, well, you know, we can't go back. So it's so important for us to identify areas that could be gates, you know, gatekeepers or, or opening those gates early on so that when they're ready, that they have all the choices in the world. They really do. So that's Genesis Works Twin Cities, great website, some great videos on there as well. I uh, encourage you to take a look at it, but also take a look at it as a model partnership uh, because I really do believe it, that it is. Yes. The question was the SPARC initiative, would it displace early child uh, family education, ECFE, or would it be in addition to? Um, and here's a great answer. It's absolutely in addition to. Um, it would be the opportunity for us to have a system to serve three-year-olds uh, in a way that only supports how their families can engage with them. So I look at it as an opportunity to have, you know, both a 3K program with ECFE tied to it. Um, it's a way for us to embrace families, um, to think about education as multi-generational, not just the little babies in front of us, uh, but their moms, dads, aunties, uncles, grandparents, you know, that, that might be with them as caretakers, and, and say that here's how you can support this young scholar to be college ready, to be career ready, to be successful, to be making positive choices in their life. So I, I, I think they go really nice together. We, of course, would want to look at having you know, so one of the create one of the things that we're working on is how can we create early childhood hubs in the city? And to me, early childhood hubs are just that. It's a place for families to come in and it's a one-stop shop for learning, for support, for anything that that family might need that can really help them support their children's education. I did want to show you. Oh, yes. I got lost. I got lost. Can you talk a little bit about the bus driver shortage and where things are at with transportation and maybe looking ahead to next 12 hour day? You know, there's, I'm sure you've learned a lot of lessons about the, the logistical weakness within a, within a district over the last 18 months. So let's talk a little bit about how you see that. Um, you know, that kind of Okay, sure. Um, first, we're going to start with some audience participation. How many of you have your CDL licenses? I'm always looking for bus drivers. Always. Um, yeah, we're still we're still short by miles. Uh, you know, we really are. Um, and I don't see that changing. I really don't. I think a few things are going to happen. I think bus drivers are in, organizations are in such demand. We're going to see costs go up without a doubt. So there are going to be some limiting factors to even having the ability to bring on more because it's going to be a financial thing. How many of you know that we spend $32 million a year on our yellow buses? 45 of them are ours. And when I say ours, very few school districts own buses, you all. They, they might have them and might say their names, but they're leasing those buses. You know, and, and, they, and they do that for obviously to identify with their district. Um, we hire 45 drivers that are ours, meaning that they're SPPS employees, it benefits, and have been part of the family for a long time. And if you stop and talk to them, they'll tell you all about it. And then we partner with about nine different charter groups, you know, who come in with their various, if you drive around St. Paul, you see, you know, no less than a dozen different uh, bus contractors. And now we've got white vans too that are helping us. Um, so again, we found out about six weeks before school, we were going to be 50 drivers short. We found out about 10 days before school, we were another 50 short, 100 drivers short to, to start. Now, here is where it's very different in St. Paul than my colleague David Engstrom in Robbinsdale. We have Metro. Robbinsdale, there is no backup. You know, there just isn't. So um, I feel very blessed and fortunate that we do have a good relationship with Metro. And even though they're strapped and have limitations too, it's been working. And I guess I should put quotes around working. I would imagine that many families are driving. I would imagine that many students are walking. And I would imagine that uh, 
you know, that the, the metro change has been really challenging. Uh, but right now it's been a savior for us and something that we're looking at strengthening. I grew up in a public transportation district from six through 12 and then, you know, led through it. So it was very normal for me. Uh, but where that partnership could be strengthened is if we can, if we can in some way be strategic about the routes and not just have to rely on the current routes uh, to have it be a little bit more specific to our student needs. Uh, but that's something that we're working on in addition to making sure that we can, you know, bring on as many as we can to our fleet. One thing I want to share with you quickly, some of you probably heard about Envision SPPS, uh, that we do have a recommendation coming before the board to close some of our facilities. Uh, our enrollment has declined over the last 10 years substantially. We currently have 8,000 underutilized seats in our elementary schools, There's 42 elementary schools. Um, and what, what happens is when schools become so small, what we call unsustainable, you know, we have to take money away from other places to subsidize them for their doors to open. And for their doors to open is a standard that I'm not okay with. I want our students to have a well-rounded education, art, music, uh, physical education, science, you know, other opportunities, a social worker. You know, these are all staff who many times we can't afford to put into our smaller schools. Uh, so it is a painful, painful process to go through. Trust me, I've heard from people. I was with our board until midnight last night talking um, about this plan that's coming forward. But I wanted to show you the enrollment in the city as well. You can see these are the demographics of kindergarten students. So in addition to our declining enrollment, there's also a declining birth rate, you know, that we have to project for as well. There was one time, and I remember this on College Bell in St. Paul, as I was part of that task force, 5,000 children are born in St. Paul every year. And, and that number is, is likely to go down based on the, the research that we've done. In addition to that, there's incredible choice in the city. There are a lot of options for students in their pre-K-12 charters, other public schools, charter schools, uh, to private schools, and through the pandemic, homeschooling. You know, we did create an online school. We threw it together very quickly. The high school one we were working on, but when COVID in July was looking one way, as you all know, in August, it looked very different. We were forced to open a K-8 in short time. So we've got about 1,500 students in a K through 12 online school right now as well. So all that to say that our build, the way we use our buildings is very different and, and they're underutilized. And, and I'd rather, you know, I really wanna to work to focus our resources. So it looks like I am uh, out of time. I just wanna thank you. My email is up here. Please reach out to me anytime. I, uh, we live right down the street. And just so you know, in 1966, this was Mechanic Arts High School. I have a board member retiring soon. They were the trainers. So I, I know a little bit about the history of SPPS too. Uh, I'll be glad that I mentioned that to you. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Gothard. Uh, we really appreciate our partnership. You know, the one thing I got is the partnership between the business community, our nonprofit sector, also the education sector in St. Paul uh, really is a powerful tool that we have as a community to, to be successful as business owners and educators and, and serving our community. So 